You know that visual politic is one of the few political channels that pays a lot of attention to Latin America, one of the least covered regions in the world. Perhaps that is why many of you have often asked us to talk more about Latin America. Well, we've got a solution. We're proud to present Latin Politic, a newsletter that we have prepared together with geopolitical consulting firm Perch Perspectives. If you subscribe every month, you will receive 12 newsletters with the best information and analysis on Latin America to keep you up to date and better understand everything that is happening in this region. The cost? You can subscribe for less than 35 cents per newsletter, less than a small taco or a donut a week. In return, you'll be kept up to date on all major happenings in the region and better understand all the possible implications. In addition, all of you who support us at Patreon level 4 and 5 will receive Latin Politics at zero cost. You can find all the info at latampolitik.com. Let me see, if I ask you to name a clean energy that could shape the future, what would your first choice be? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Depending on how carefully you read the title of this video, most of you probably thought of windmills and solar panels. However, this time, here on Visual Politic, we are going to talk about something very, very different. Of a type of energy that has barely entered our lives, but that many analysts think could cause a whole new revolution. And I am talking about hydrogen. And yes, I know, I know, isn't hydrogen the most plentiful element in the universe? Well, yes, but the thing is that on Earth, it is not so abundant. Barely 0.000055% of atmospheric air is hydrogen, and most of the hydrogen on our planet is contained in water and other hydrocarbons. That is, integrated with other atoms. For example, as you all know, water is H2O, two hydrogen atoms for one oxygen atom. So to be able to speak strictly of hydrogen and use it to generate useful energy, we have to separate those atoms from the oxygen ones. Or, to put it another way, to be able to use it on our planet, we need to manufacture hydrogen, a process that can be achieved in several ways. We will look at this in a moment, but I can already tell you that one of the key points of this resource is precisely that there is more than one way to get it. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Dear friends, how can we harness hydrogen for energy? What are its advantages? Does it really have a future? Well, in this video, we're going to answer all these questions. We will get to know a little better an element that some scientists believe may be the solution to almost all of the energy and climate problems and challenges that we face. Would you like to join us to learn about what could be a whole new revolution? Well, let's get started. <laughs> Ultimate fuel? For the vast majority of us, this topic may seem a little far-fetched, but the truth is that hydrogen has been used in industry for many years. In fact, around 70 million tonnes are currently produced each year, a figure that has tripled since 1975 and is currently increasing at full speed. And many of you will ask, okay, but what exactly does industry use hydrogen for? Well, the answer is mainly in the metallurgical industry, in refineries and in the electronics industry, as well as for the manufacture of fertilizers and ammonia, among other things. Those are its main uses today. But friends, hydrogen has another use that could make a difference, obtaining electrical energy. And this is where we have to talk about the hydrogen fuel cell. These cells are somewhat similar to a battery, but instead of being recharged with electricity, as is the case with lithium ion batteries, those used in today's electric cars, they are recharged with a fuel, in this case, hydrogen. That is to say, this technology allows us to obtain electrical energy for whatever we want, and also allows us to store it, as we will see later. In this way, hydrogen fuel cells would allow us to use a zero emission car and recharge it in a hydrogen station in a matter of minutes, allowing us to drive another 400 kilometers. We would simply have to refuel hydrogen usually in liquid form, as if it were gasoline, diesel or LPG. Now, as we told you before, there is hardly any pure hydrogen available on Earth, and so we have to quote unquote manufacture it, which raises a few questions. Is it expensive to produce? Can it be widely used? And how polluting is this process? Well, it depends. You see, depending on how it is produced, we can differentiate three types of hydrogen, grey, blue, and green. And no, it is not that hydrogen comes in different colours, but simply that there are several different raw materials, several methods that we can use to get it. 
let's start with grey. I'm sure the more astute of you have already realised that the term grey does not usually evoke anything too good or too clean. And you're totally right, because grey hydrogen is one that is produced plainly and simply by burning fossil fuels such as coal. But weren't we talking about clean energy? Yes, and ironically, this practice is being carried out today. Although not so much with the idea that this hydrogen is used for sustainable mobility, but for example, for industrial use. We are talking about a method that is quite cheap. The average cost is just $1 per kilogram of hydrogen. But how exactly does this process work? Well, take a look. <laughs> Hydrogen can be obtained from coal by a process called coal gasification, which we will not go into here, but which results in synthesis gas, a compound that contains hydrogen, which is then extracted from the gas. Well, the point is that there are two ways to get rid of the polluting gases from this process. The traditional method of releasing it through a chimney with no regard to what it pollutes, or injecting it and storing it in an underground reservoir, which is something that is being investigated in the Latrobe Valley in Australia, which is a country very rich in coal. Obviously, if we are talking about clean energy, this would be the method to go for. However, the main problem with this method would be the cost of storing all those gases in underground reservoirs, and also the possible environmental implications and risks, such as possible leaks into aquifers, or the possibility that it could end up causing seismic movements, as happened in Spain with the Castor project. And this is precisely where we come in with blue hydrogen. Where do you think that name comes from? Well, think about what happens when you burn natural gas. Exactly, a blue flame comes out. Well, blue hydrogen comes mainly from natural gas. And today, this seems to be the most reasonable alternative. Because believe me when I tell you that there is so much natural gas in the world that no one knows what to do with it all. In fact, on many occasions, oil producing countries are forced to burn rather than exploit this resource when they encounter pockets of natural gas while trying to extract oil. And don't think I'm talking about some banana republic. Flaring natural gas is a relatively common practice, even in places like Texas. Oil producers are setting billions of dollars on fire. Massive amounts of natural gas are being burned to make way for oil production. Unless the incentives are changed, the harmful practice will become even more common in the US. Wall Street Journal. For example, According to the World Bank estimates, in 2018, 5.1 trillion cubic feet of natural gas was flared worldwide, simply because no one knew what else to do with it. That's the equivalent of the combined consumption of France, Germany and Belgium. Crazy! Well, hydrogen in this case would be obtained by what is known as steam reforming of natural gas, a process that we are not going to explain because we're not exactly experts in chemistry and it's not our mission. But let's just say that it takes advantage of methane gas, which contains hydrogen, to break molecules and thus get what interests us. <laughs> Today, this form of hydrogen production is most widely used around the world. So much so that 6% of all the natural gas consumed by the planet is used to produce hydrogen. But again, although gas is much cleaner than coal, the problem is pollutant emissions. Currently, no less than 95% of the world's hydrogen is produced with fossil fuels, and specifically, 75% is produced with natural gas, which means that every year, 830 million tonnes of carbon dioxide are emitted into the atmosphere as a result of this process. This is the equivalent to all the annual emissions of an industrial power such as Germany. A note though, it is also common to consider hydrogen generated with natural gas as grey hydrogen, reserving the blue label exclusively for hydrogen generated with natural gas and whose emissions are largely captured and stored underground. Let's just say that the semantic classifications are not entirely fixed. But wait a minute, weren't we supposed to be talking about clean energy? Okay, yes, natural gas is much less polluting than coal. But if hydrogen depends on it, I don't know, it doesn't seem like a great alternative. At least not much better than the ones that we already know, right? Well, my dear friends, here we come to the crux of the matter. If you remember correctly, there were not two, but three types of hydrogen. The third was green, green hydrogen. And it is precisely this green hydrogen that many analysts, experts, and scientists believe could be the main player in a new energy revolution. Listen up. Reality or illusion? 
When we hear about the revolutionary hydrogen fuel cell cars developed by companies such as Hyundai, Honda, or Toyota, a new type of car comes to mind. A car that does not pollute and can be fully refueled in just four minutes. In fact, both Hyundai's Nexo model and Toyota's Mirai, which are currently the two most popular hydrogen cars marketed to the general public, state that they are completely clean vehicles that only expel water from the exhaust pipe. Whilst technically true, the vehicles are clean, the point is that the hydrogen used to power them does not have to be. At the moment, the only option to solve this small inconvenience is the one known as green hydrogen, which is obtained using renewable energies. In this way, with the electricity produced by renewable energies through a process known as electrolysis, this clean energy would be used to break down the water molecule, which, as you will know, is H2O, and thus obtain hydrogen. The problem is that this process is currently very expensive due to the enormous amount of electricity needed. In fact, while producing a kilo of hydrogen wood coal, it would cost around $1. To produce it with renewables it will take between three and seven and a half dollars, a very significant difference. And yes, as we've told you on Visual Politic, the cost of renewable energy is getting lower every day, and the technological evolution could well make green hydrogen competitive, but right now it's not. And this is where the biggest questions arise. Could hydrogen really be the fuel of the future? Of course, to answer this question, perhaps we should first ask ourselves another question. What exactly do we want this fuel for? What do we want to do with it? What can it be used for? Perhaps hydrogen is the future for some applications and not for others. For example, let's think about a personal car. Going for a hydrogen vehicle would cost us at least $60,000, while we can find similar electric cars for only half the price. And so far, the only noticeable difference is the recharging time, something that electric car manufacturers have also announced will be substantially reduced over the next few years. So does the hydrogen car make sense? Yes, okay, prices are sure to come down as the technology matures, which is exactly what is happening with electric cars right now. But if we take into account all the investments that companies and governments are announcing, typically in favor of the electric car, then many analysts are betting that a hydrogen car is unlikely to break through. However, even if we rule out this possibility, let's look a little further ahead and think, for example, of buses, trucks, or even, why not, large merchant ships. Okay, there is not yet a single viable commercially available long haul electric bus or truck model. But what if the future of hydrogen as a transportation fuel is right there? Think about it for a moment. What kind of a battery does a truck or a bus need to have a decent range? In principle, it would be a huge battery, which would probably reduce a lot of charging space and also greatly increase the vehicle weight. I'm sure you've all seen an electric city bus with a kind of huge hump on top or a super thick roof where the battery is stored. Such an approach seems unfeasible for long intercity journeys. And here, hydrogen could be a contender. Just look at this chart. Of all the greenhouse gases emitted, road transport accounts for 11.9%. And of that total, 27% is emitted by trucks and buses, even though they only account for about 19% of all registered vehicles on the road. But what if hydrogen fuel cell technology for cars could be adapted to a truck or a bus? What if all the trucks and buses were hydrogen powered and we could suddenly eliminate more than a quarter of all the pollution caused by land transport? Now don't tell me, that doesn't sound interesting. And we could see exactly the same for large merchant ships or even commercial aircraft, which are one of the biggest sources of CO2 emissions worldwide. Airbus looks to the future with hydrogen planes. The company said its hydrogen-fueled passenger planes could be in service by 2035. BBC. Of course, these plans are still in a very experimental phase, and whether it is cars, trucks, buses, or even ships and airplanes, there are common obstacles that could push the possible widespread use of this energy back many, many years. Because friends, we are talking about a type of energy that does have many advantages, yes, but also faces many challenges today. Listen up. An energy that is too green? Whether or not it is the energy alternative of the future, hydrogen as a fuel still has a long way to go. And the main problem is not in the cost of hydrogen fuel cell cars, nor even the pollution generated by producing it. The key problem is that there is still no economy of scale for this technology. There is still not enough demand for hydrogen for it to become economically viable to mass produce it with, for example, renewable energy. And there certainly isn't enough demand for hydrogen cars right now to drive their prices down either, which means there's clearly not even enough demand for places where you can go and refuel your hydrogen fuel cell car. 
give you an example. In South Korea, which is the country in the world where this technology is most advanced and where most hydrogen cars are sold, during 2019, only 5,083 units were sold. The problem with hydrogen lies not only in the $70,000 to $100,000 cost of a Hyundai Nexo vehicle, but also in the fact that, as we mentioned, there is hardly any refueling infrastructure. This is despite the Korean government's efforts to create a more or less extensive network of hydrogen stations. 310 hydrogen refueling stations in Korea by 2022. Hydrogen Council. A target that the South Korean government has raised to 450 hydrogen stations by 2025. This of course means putting a lot of public money on the table. With this move, the country aims to reach its goal of 200,000 hydrogen cars on the road by 2025. Is Korea getting ahead of the new revolution? Only time will tell. What is clear is that it is not easy to launch a new technology from scratch and make it catch on with consumers when there is hardly any infrastructure ready and also when producing clean hydrogen is still, to date, an expensive option. Of course, if the technology continues to improve and the cost of clean electricity continues to fall, then we could be looking at clean vehicles, ships and airplanes. And that, my friends, would be quite a revolution. Electric vehicles have certainly been ahead of hydrogen ones in terms of development and adoption, but I think hydrogen is catching up due to advances in high pressure hydrogen gas storage fuel tanks, fuel cell technology, and hydrogen production from renewable energy. John Andrews, professor at RMIT University in Melbourne. Oh, and I almost forgot, there is another possible market for hydrogen besides its use as a fuel that is most interesting. Have you ever wondered how big a leap we would make in terms of energy if we were able to store the energy produced by wind turbines or solar panels and thus continue to have electricity supply from these sources when there's no sun or no wind? Well, take note because one of the options being considered is that it could be a feasible way to store renewable energy by converting it into hydrogen. This hydrogen could then be used for industry to produce heat or to power cars, trucks, ships and airplanes. In other words, it would be something like storing surplus electricity by creating hydrogen that can be stored and transported to where it is needed. Dear friends, at Visual Politic, we can't tell you if this technology has a future. If one day we will see our streets full of hydrogen vehicles or a lot of factories using it as a main source of energy. But what we can tell you, however, is that technological evolution is advancing rapidly and in very promising ways. But at this point, we want to know, what do you think? Do you think hydrogen can become the energy source of the future? Do you think the hydrogen fuel cell car has the potential to replace, along with electric cars, fossil fuels? Or is it perhaps a technology that will end up being used only for very specific sectors? Leave your answer down in the comments. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. If you want to learn more about politics and world affairs and hear some more of my lovely voice, come check out the Reconsider podcast where we don't do the thinking for you. Find Reconsider at www.reconsidermedia.com or on Apple or Google Play or your favorite podcatcher.